And so I started to sort of write towards understanding the cultures and places and people that my family came from, just for myself doing a lot of research. Um, and, and then also, you know, relatedly kind of exploring the connections that I was finding between my own life and, you know, that history that, that shaped the choices that my family made and that my parents made and even their, um, their finding each other in Massachusetts was sort of the result of that history. You know, um, a lot of Armenian refugees um, ended up in Watertown, Massachusetts. There's a large Armenian population there with a very rich history. Um, and so I was writing myself towards that connection um, to understanding them and, and, and through that um, more deeply understanding myself. And it was really a project that started from a place of grief. You know, I was grieving the loss of my father and grieving um, what I saw then is the abandonment of my mother. Uh, I'm Margaret Talcott. I am the producer of literary events at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society. And it's great to have you with us. Since last April, we have presented 23 of these virtual talks on all sorts of topics, all about America, our ancestors and their experiences of this country, our cultural history and our identity. And that's where we are tonight looking at the life story of one American who, like so many of us, is a mix of different cultures. Some of Nadia's relatives are from Boston. Her parents, in fact, met here in Boston. Before that, they, their relatives were from all over the world, from Ghana, Armenia, and Turkey. Nadia's story is a familiar one. It's an American tale of complex allegiances and complex identities. Before Nadia joins us, I want to share some background on both her and our, and our moderator, Jessica Shattuck. Nadia joins us from New York, from Brooklyn, where she works as a writer and an urban planner. She is a recipient, recipient of a 2019 Whiting Award, which is a really great honor. Her lyric essay, So Devilish a Fire, won the Atlas Review Chapbook Contest. Nadia's writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the New York Times, the Washington Post's The Lily, in Literary Review, Electric Literature, Epiphany, and Catapult. Um, Aftershocks is her first book. This evening's moderator, Jessica Shattuck, comes to us from Brookline, Massachusetts. She is the New York Times bestselling author of the novels, The Women in the Castle, Perfect Life, and The Hazards of Good Breeding, which was a New York Times notable book and a finalist for the Penn Winship Award. Her writing has appeared in The New Yorker, in Wired, in New York Times, in Glamour, and in other publications. Uh, Jessica will join us shortly. She'll be on screen with Nadia in just a few minutes. Um, for now though, Nadia, over to you. We are so glad that you are here. Welcome and please do tell us more. First of all, thank you very much um, to American Ancestors and GBH for organizing this event. I'm so excited to be part of this wonderful series and, and thank you all to everyone who's in the audience for being here. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to open by sharing a little bit about myself and, and my new memoir, Aftershocks. So I describe the book as a literary memoir with threads of cultural history to explore themes like complexities of family, the meaning of home, the multiplicity of identity, and the ripple effects, both personal and generational, of trauma. A bit about my story. Uh, my mother left when I was two. After living for two years with my father's sister Harriet and our cousin Laura, while our father set up his life in a way that was conducive to raising two little girls, my sister Yasmin and I were raised by our father, who was the great hero of my life. And he worked for a UN agency, so we moved to a different country every couple of years. When I was seven and we were living in Rome, um, after a long absence, my mother showed up at our house on the same day that I learned about a catastrophic earthquake that destroyed the city of Spitak in Armenia. And my father always listened to the BBC World Service in the morning, and I remember the voice on the radio talking about the possibility of aftershocks. And I remember asking my father what aftershocks are, and he said, there are tremors that follow an earthquake. They're the Earth's delayed reaction to stress. And later that day, my mother took my sister and me to lunch and we walked around Piazza Navona. And then that evening she dropped us back at our house and was gone again. 
And maybe because my mother is Armenian American, or maybe because my father generally avoided the topic of my mother, and I felt like I wasn't supposed to talk about her, the earthquake and my personal shaking and having my mother show up and leave so quickly um, sort of combined and conflated inside me. And I became obsessed with earthquakes and specifically the ways we predict and measure disaster. And this obsession fermented as I got older and lived through other disasters, both private and seismic. A civil war in Ethiopia, my father's death when I was 13 and my mother still not coming to claim me, an act of terrorism in Uganda, a shaky relationship with my stepmother with whom I lived after my father died, being at the World Trade Center on 9-11 after I had moved to New York for college, panic attacks and depression. And I began to think of my own life as existing on fault lines. I was a global citizen and a person without a clear home. I have a US passport. My father was Ghanaian. My mother is Armenian from Watertown, Massachusetts. And my stepmother is Tanzanian. But I'm always an outsider in those cultures in some ways. And I struggle to find steady ground, even in my own sense of self. And at times I was tormented by these signals in my body, like those of a seismometer, warning me that another disaster was coming. Then when I was in my 20s, my stepmother came to visit me in New York and we had a fight and she revealed what is either a secret or a lie about my father. And she caused me to question my relationship with him, one of the few things in my life that was constant and steady. And what followed for me was a real reckoning. And I retreated for a week to a blue rocking chair in my bedroom. And I felt like I needed to retreat from my life to grieve in a way I'd never allowed myself and to imagine and write myself a story I could live in because a lot of the stories I'd been given about my history, African history and the history of the Armenian genocide that brought my ancestors to America, for example, were not inhabitable for me. And those histories are often ill-treated as are the stories of families like mine, immigrant families Black families, families from the so-called developing world. And I wanted to narrate myself to deeper understanding of the beautiful and rich histories and cultures of the places my family came from and this country that I now live in and all the places I've briefly called home along the way and the forces and private choices that shaped my life. So this book started as a way to overcome the aches of isolation, dislocation and disconnection aches that we're all probably feeling right now in some ways. Um, and I began writing from a place of grief, but I found I was really writing toward love and connection, uh, even eventually toward reconciliation with my mother, with whom I now have a relationship that I'm very grateful for, that both of us have worked hard to create through openness, compassion, and forgiveness. And I discovered in writing how actively people in my life worked to love me and how actively I held on to love for them across oceans and continents and estrangements. And I learned that we can persevere in loving each other, even when, and probably especially when, distance or other forces make it difficult. And that's the biggest message I took away from the experience of writing the book. And I hope um, that it's one that readers can connect to as we all navigate these uncertain times. And I'm now going to read a very uh, brief excerpt from Aftershocks from a chapter called Failures of Language. Failures of Language. I do not have my great grandfather's worn but carefully pressed cotton handkerchief. My father's family aren't much for holding on to material things. I do not have my maternal great grandmother's red hair or my paternal grandfather's coffee bean skin. What an unusual combination, people often say when I describe my parentage, Ghanaian, Armenian, and more than once, how did that even happen? I speak three and a half languages that do not belong to me, that do not run through my veins, English, Italian, and French, decent Swahili. When my relatives and country people maneuver between English and their home languages, tree, Armenian, and Turkish, I grip the ropes of the English words as firmly as my jittery hands will allow and loop them into knots. I watch for cocked eyebrows and pursed lips to translate the rest. The warm round percussion of tree and the orderly harmony of Turkish, which spoken by my family, is diluted with a splash of archaic Armenian and a heavy pour of Boston accent are familiar but impenetrable. 
I can spot members of my two disparate tribes in a crowd, but I cannot address them except in basic greeting and pleasantry. Good morning, how are you? Welcome. In tree, I can also say even the elephant can swat flies with its short tail and any river loses its identity when entering the sea. My father, when his intention was to remind or chastise, was fond of proverbs and folk tales. The heroes of those tales were animals of the forests, spirits, and gods. I know them by name. My Ghanaian relatives are at times tickled by my inability to speak tree. At other times, they are affronted. How can you not speak your own language, they ask, not acknowledging that my learning it would have required them to teach me. Once when I was in the market with an auntie, I cannot remember which one, a woman asked why no one had taught me to speak my father tongue. Nobody wants to hear her speaking tree in an American accent, the auntie replied. Since she replied in English, I can only assume she meant for me to understand. In Chi, I cannot say, love me, accept me. At 13, I could not ask my father not to die. In Turkish, I know the words for eggplant, yogurt, and savory pastries. The stories of my mother's family are very much concerned with food. What was served, whose dish was tastiest, and delicious gossip, who messed up the baklava. As a child, when I visited them in Massachusetts, we talked about eggplant, losh kebab, and pilaf with little chopped up noodles in it. We planned for dinner as we washed lunch dishes. We ate to remember those who escaped genocide and nearly starved in the desert, to honor what they made possible for us. My grandmother taught me to roll rice and lamb into grape leaves. My mother read to me from 1001 Nights. Alibaba said, open sesame and discovered a stolen treasure. A genie emerged from a lamp to do Aladdin's bidding. Scheherazade told tales to a king to delay her own execution. Another one, I said to my mother after each story, tell me another one. I do not know the Turkish word for stay. At seven, I could not say, mama, come back. In Armenian, the language largely lost to my mother's family generations ago at the hands of the Ottoman Empire. The only word I know is the word for underwear, vardig. This knowledge I cannot explain. When I encounter strangers from my tribes, they are startled by my attempts to communicate. They do not recognize me as one of their own. They laugh, charmed and perhaps a little disturbed by the discrepancy between appearance and sound. When I explain myself, they think me a curious hybrid. They speak to me always in English. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. That was beautiful. I'm so glad you read that passage, which so captures so much of the spirit of your book. Thank you so I'm much. So glad to be here today and to be talking with you. Um, I have to say that I read the book in almost one sitting, I couldn't put it down. It's, you've got a real mesmerizing way of, of articulating all of the, um, it's just that the language is mesmerizing and then the themes are so vast and interesting, but you bring them down into such a point. Um, one thing I was really struck by was how you've managed to write both such a deeply moving personal memoir but at the same time, a provoking examination of such a, of many broader geopolitical subjects, um, race, colonialism, what national identity means in an increasingly global world. And I have questions for you on both of those axes, but I figured we would start with the personal because it is a memoir. And I think that probably that's something that many of the readers here um, and, and viewers are interested in. So I guess one thing I, I wondered, your, your structure is so interesting and um, creative in the way that you've cobbled together the, uh, the pieces through the, this metaphor of an earthquake and aftershocks. And I wondered at what point, I mean, did you sort of sit down and start writing um, and think immediately I'm writing a memoir or was that, did that come out of the, did you just start writing out of the sort of place of hurt and grief that you talk about? And then eventually sort of 
step back and at, at what point if it was that way like how did it then occur to you as maybe I'm actually writing a memoir what was mm -hmm. the process thanks for that Jessica and thanks so much for doing this and for your kind words I really appreciate it um so yeah I I did start writing um as as a private project I was I was doing a lot of research about the places that my family came from and the cultures because although in some ways I felt deeply connected especially to my father's family and and to his culture and you know I was raised for a time by my father's sisters and spent some time growing up in Ghana um but at the same time um, because I didn't grow up uh, fully nested in that culture and because I didn't speak the language, you know, there were these um, these divisions sort of linguistic and cultural and the history of Ghana was not, for example, something that I studied in school. And then similarly, as my mother was very much in my mind and in, in my 20s, um, you know, we had had a long um, separation. I hadn't seen her since I was a child and I was really starting to think about her. And, and so I started to sort of write towards understanding the cultures and places and people that my family came from just for myself doing a lot of research um and and then also you know relatedly kind of exploring the connections that i was finding between my own life and you know that history that that shaped the choices that my family made and that my parents made and even their um their finding each other in Massachusetts was sort of the result of that history. You know, um, a lot of Armenian refugees um, ended up in Watertown, Massachusetts. There's a large Armenian population there with a very rich history. Um, and so I was writing myself towards that connection um, to understanding them and, and, and through that um, more deeply understanding myself. And it was really a project that started from a place of grief. You know, I was grieving the loss of my father and grieving um, what I saw then as the abandonment of my mother. And, and what I found was that I actually was writing towards reconciliation and forgiveness and connection um, to, uh, to my parents, to my family, um, to their histories. Um, and, and so it did start as a private project, but as I got deeper into it and then with a little bit of distance, I sort of set it aside for a while. And when I came back to it, um, I saw that you know, that there was a lot there that maybe I could make into art. You know, I did have these writing dreams, although I wasn't necessarily thinking of this project um, as, as you know, what would become my first book. And in fact, I thought I was gonna write a novel first. And, um, and then I realized, you know, especially through um, sort of the coaching of some of my mentors who said, no, the heat is in this. I submitted a couple of pieces from this book and they said, this is where the heat is. Um, and, and so that kind of made me made me think, okay, how can I um, take this private project that I had started for myself and make art out of it? And so that's where the questions of stru how to structure it and how, you know, the more private um, moments and the bigger histories could be woven together. And that was a big challenge to kind of find that structure. Um, but it was also something that once I started paying attention to my own work in a different way, I realized that I was kind of organically doing. And so I wanted to trust myself to write into that. Um, because that was sort of the, the intention behind, you know, beginning to write this book was connecting myself to those broader histories. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I, um, I, I guess I, I am very um, impressed by the vulnerability of, uh, of putting yourself out there in the world, writing a memoir. I have other friends who've, who've written memoirs and I know that even with writing fiction, it can feel that way. I wrote my last book was, was somewhat inspired by my own family history. And I felt I was talking about that a lot when I was talking about the book on book tour. And it, it felt very, um, it, it did feel very close to the bone sometimes, and um, I felt very exposed. And I can only imagine how much greater that feeling of exposure is when it's actually your memoir and it's sort of, there's no hiding behind, well, these are characters, this is a work of fiction. Um, so I guess I, I thought about that, especially in the context of this moment in time where it feels like everyone feels entitled to say something about everything. And everyone feels the right to judge everything down to the smallest pieces of, of you know, things that can seem insignificant to you in the moment. 
And I wondered what, um, in, in the process of coming out with this, realizing, okay, this is a memoir, I'm gonna put this out into the world as that kind of book. What were you concerned about? Were there things that you worried about or that you, um, I don't know, that just stuck in your mind, whether it was, you can answer that either on a personal level in terms of, I'm sure there are, are many people who are mentioned in your book who you might've had in mind, or on the broader level also of some of the themes you raise and and anything that you thought might be, oh, I'm stepping into a touch, you know, a touch point or a, a hot button issue. And how's that? What, what were what were some of those concerns or did you have those kind of concerns at all? Yeah, I mean, I didn't at first because I really was um, trying to get at the truth, like or a truth of my own family and histories and experience and to put a lot of those stories down on the page. And it was really important to me um, to make everyone in my life really complex and to write into that complexity, including myself and, you know, to, not to make the people in my life one dimensional. So often people will ask, you know, were you worried about how the people in your life would react? And, you know, I, I, they're, they're of course, like as I was getting closer to publication, I did share, you know, some of the pieces with family members. They had read some that were published. And of course there is that concern and you, you want to honor people's fullness of their humanity. And also like, I, I did open the book by saying, you know, there are facts and there is truth. And, you know, we all experienced um, in my family the kind of the same set of facts. Um, and I think like, particularly in this moment, like we have to be really clear about what the facts are because facts are often in question these days, but then there, there is the, there are the truths of how we experience the world as individual people and the emotional feeling of those facts and how we connect to them. And that's the story that I wanted to tell. And so I have kind of a, a note, an author's note in my book that notes that, that just because I'm writing, this is my version. I don't have all of the information about everyone in my family and their version. Um, now that I'm more in conversation, you know, in some ways this book has opened up more conversation with my family so that I've been able to hear more of their, their stories. And, you know, writing my version doesn't mean that I don't believe theirs. And I wanted to make that really clear. So that was something that I wrestled with a lot in the writing of it and tried to approach it you know, from a place of openness and, and trying to understand and um, have compassion for others and for myself. Um, and then, yeah, it is something, you know, you do feel exposed kind of putting your life out there. But I think one of the things that I was really clear about was that I wanted it to be an act of self-interrogation and reckoning. And so I do, you know, make myself complicit where I was complicit. And I um, I, I tried in the book to really be honest about the places where I contributed to harmful dynamics or where I could have done better. Um, and I think because that was really important to me, I feel less fear at being criticized. I'm sure that like there will be some some criticism, but you know, I, I really did approach it as a as a reckoning for myself um, so that I could grow as a person as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, the, your honesty is one of the hallmarks of this book, I think. It really, um, I was so struck by how the, the feeling of intimacy and honesty that you bring to the page when you're writing about things where you are being self-critical as well as, as looking at the behavior of others. Um, one thing along, uh, in, on a different act, a different element of this axis, I, um, you're something that I wanted to mention is how extremely your father came alive for me. And I think for many readers will come alive so strongly. And um, as somebody who I also lost a parent when my mother died when I was 15. And I know that you carry with you in your life this feeling of, of wanting to make sure that they're with you and that you bring them along with you and you introduce them to the people that you love and that you get to know who may have never known them. Um, and you really, the book has such a, such a powerful feeling of he, he's on the page and he comes to life in, in, in your mind as a reader. Um, and I wondered, is that, was that something that did you feel, um, was there a kind of healing that came with that? I think a lot of, of questions that I, I was reading over some of the questions that people had, um, going into this, who had signed up for this. And many people wanted to know about the sort of therapeutic elements of writing a memoir and of writing through some of the trauma and loss you've been through. 
And um, so I wondered if you wanted to speak to that a little bit. Did that feel, did that feel healing in some way? Yeah, it did. You know, my father was truly, you know, as I said, the great hero of my life. And I still think about him every day, you know, and I've, I've long known that my grief is both um, sort of a part of who I am. And I also sometimes think of it as a place that I find strange comfort in and that I retreat to. And it's a, you know, it's a familiar place. And um, in some ways, you know, grief is the flip side of love. And so in returning to my grief, I sometimes find that I can connect to that deep love that I felt for my father, which was also, um, I found, you know, the place that I was writing from, which, um, you know, I was trying to write towards the knowledge of that love that has carried me as well. You know, grief is a, the grief is a big part of who I am, but that love um, that he had for me and that I had for him really has sustained me throughout my life. I lost him young, but it really has been a force, um, that has, um, that has, yeah, sustained my life. Um, and carried me through difficult times and given me strength and hope and and a belief that you know even when i'm lonely or sad that that love exists in the world and and that it can exist for me again um and so it did feel really important to me to write him in such a way that readers could understand who he was and so it's it's actually really moving to hear that that you know that he came alive for you on the page because it really was an attempt for me to sort of like remember him and honor his memory and um and similarly writing about my mother you know we did it's it's very easy for me to tell the story of my mother as you know she left when i was two and i grew up largely without my mother which is which is true you know that is a truth but there are, we also did share tender moments and laughter and joy and we had visits with each other and you know, she did make some attempts to reconcile at different points in her life. And there were things that I didn't know about her life as a child that I felt like I could be more open to understanding. And that was important for me to realize and to let go of that anger so that I could find some possibility of, of reconnecting and reconciling. And so, yeah, the writing itself was sort of an act of healing for me. You know, it's not therapy, like I still go to therapy, um, but, but, it, but it does have therapeutic uh, qualities. And, you know, as I said, I did find that ultimately I was writing towards deeper connection and compassion for people in my life, for myself, um, and, you know, that I could bring into the world in the way that I continue to live my life and learn um, from other people. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, it definitely comes across. I think that's one of the, the main things that comes out of reading this. Um, I want to switch a little bit to the to the sort of geopolitical landscape that you paint in this memoir. And one of my, if, if I can take two minutes to read a little, a passage from it that really moved me and that I, I was, I sort of caught my breath. Um, I, I should explain to our viewers that uh, as you've mentioned, but you grew up, uh, you lived adjacent to so much terrible suffering at different times where you were even in fact, literally across the street from a refugee camp. Um, when you were in Ethiopia, and you wrote at, at in in the book, um, you're describing a, a a scene where you were driving by a child beggar who either fainted or died, and you don't even really know because you're passing in the car. And you write, um, I'm quoting now, the boy's bird body still haunts me. He hovers over me in judgment when I feel sorry for myself, but he cannot stop me from feeling sorry for myself. And I felt in that you were really articulating something at the heart of what it means right now to be a global citizen, that we are aware of so much around us. We're aware of our place in the world, but at the same time, we're really insulated often um, in, a, in a much more extreme way than you were insulated when you were just you know, yards away. But even then you write about that feeling of insulation of living in a compound. Um, how do you think that your proximity to such drastic and desperate situations um, influenced you? And did you feel a kind of duty to bear witness to that in, in your writing? Yeah, um, so I, you know, because of my father's job, um, I was always very, and because of who he was, you know, 
he worked for the United Nations and his job meant that he was often working in refugee camps sort of delivering emergency food aid in, in disasters, you know, famine, war. Um, and so often we would live in, in those places. Um, but as you're saying, like from a remove, I lived in UN compounds. I was chauffeured around by drivers. There were armed uh, guards at the gate. Um, and yet my father talked to me a lot about that injustice and how we have to make choices every day to undo it. And he was always emphasizing to me that I am deeply connected to the people who, you know, as you said, lived across the street from me in a shanty town and that we all are, you know, even, yeah. And I think we're all realizing that now, just how deeply connected we all are um, and how we are um, the most vulnerable among us at the end of the day are, that is our fate, you know? And so I think we are living in this moment where a lot of people are kind of thinking about interconnection differently. And that was always a message that was really important for my the to my father and um, was a lesson that he emphasized over and over again and sort of pushed me to ask questions about the world and about myself and my place in it. Um, and and so that has those questions have always been sort of a um, a force in my life that I have wrestled with, including sort of in my choice of career. In addition to to uh, being a writer, I work kind of in social justice spaces um, and uh, for nonprofit organizations that are working on issues of in inequality, inequity, poverty. Um, and to me, like my writing life and and my career in in those spaces are very much intertwined. I'm really grappling with those same questions. And in some ways, you know, as I was narrating myself closer to the people um, in my family, I was also sort of trying to better understand these disasters that I had lived through as a child and honor um, the people who really lived through them, you know, not not in a UN compound, by spending time to understand like how those um, conflicts came to be, um, what it was like for people. And so that was research that I felt really committed to doing as well, because although those conflicts um, and those forces shaped my life in so many ways, I was a child and I didn't deeply understand them necessarily. Um, but as an adult, um, I felt a, a responsibility to more deeply understand them, particularly if I was going to be writing about these places, which I couldn't write about my life without writing about those places. And so I wanted to ask myself, how am I accountable um, to the people who welcomed me into their communities and homes and, you know, um, and how do I honor their histories in the way that I'm attempting to honor mine as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, that ties into the, um, the I, I loved reading the parts of your book where you really went sort of deeply into some of the histories of the countries that you lived in and some of the politics that led to the uh, catastrophes that you were there to, or your father was there to help deal with. Um, and I wondered, I mean, there was, I think all of you readers are, are in for a treat in terms of going into there. I learned a lot. I didn't know, I mean, and, and you, you, you create these very sort of, um, they're kind of concise, but really engaging um, pieces on, on what it was like, how on Gha Ghanaian history, um, Uganda, what was going on there in Tanzania. I, I wondered if in was there one of those that you became particularly interested in? Were there was there anything? It was one of those um, pieces, sort of especially compelling to you, or was there anything that you found in your research that was particularly surprising to you? Um, so I think I think I can probably find something in all of them that was was surprising to me, just because you know, living in a country that you don't fully belong to as a child, there's so much that you miss um, and, or that you don't pay attention to. And so, you know, for example, I was delighted in, in writing about Tanzania to think about the connection between Tanzanians and country music, for example. There's a great love of American country music in Tanzania. And as a child, I heard it all the time, but I didn't think very much of it. Like, what is this connection? Why do Tanzanians love country music? And in exploring it, you know, speaking of like how we're all connected, I realized that, you know, the, a lot of tribes in Tanzania are actually cowboys in their own way. You know, they they raise cattle and, you know, they sort of um, live in, in sort of this kind of similar bucolic kind of lifestyle. And I, and I think that they are drawn to both those 
uh, that idea um, that feels more familiar and more like home to them than say, you know, New York City or Los Angeles, but also so many African traditions um, have oral storytelling traditions. And so the storytelling nature of country music, I think also deeply connects um, to Tanzanian. So it was those kinds of details, you know, um, often with the um, essays that I was writing, I started from a memory. So of course, you know, I had this memory of listening to country music um, in a car um, in Tanzania, and then sort of that uh, raises my curiosity to think, okay, why was that? Is that something that is more commonplace? And then doing research and discovering that, yes, actually there is this great love there, but there were so many things like that, um, that I discovered. Um, and, um, and that was one of the great joys of writing the book. You know, I got to, um, travel to all of the places that I called home in a different way. Yeah, I love that that part about the country music. I found that also very surprising and, and interesting. Um, I'm going to wrap up with my questions and we'll move on to the audience questions. I'm going to, in, in closing, something that I also think came out of uh, several questions that I saw ahead of time. Uh, people are curious about your reconciliation with your mother. You talk a lot about writing toward reconciliation. Um, how, you know, it's, it, it must have been very complicated that she left when you were so young and um, that then to come back at that as an adult and and try to, it, it did, did part of that motivation come out of the process of writing the book? Um, uh, so it came, it's part of it came out of the process. Well, so I should say that it came out of um, sort of what led me to write the book, which was, you know, this grief that I was carrying and, and regret and, um, and yes, for my father, but also for my mother. Um, you know, I'd always felt her absence very profoundly in my life, even though I didn't know her very well. And, you know, I had this album of photographs that I, you know, took with me everywhere as I moved around the world and brought with me to New York when I moved here. And I would, you know, stare at these photographs of myself and my mother um, when I was a child. And, and like, I didn't allow myself to fully feel that grief, but it was, it was always there. And um, so that's part of what led me to kind of put some of my feelings down to work to understand them, you know, as many writers do, I work to understand what I think. Um, and so um, the process of writing helped me to sort of contextualize her life and understand some of her choices and brought back memories that maybe explained some of how things came to be the way that they were. And also just allowed me to honor my own feelings that, you know, my longing for her was stronger than my anger. And that my anger was not serving me and it wasn't serving her and she had made attempts to reconcile in the past. And, and so um, in some ways, yeah, the writing, the writing of what came before the book, you know, the, the kind of more raw version of what became the book did help me to ultimately reach out to her and see if we could um, build a, a, a new relationship um, as, as grownups and I'm really, I'm really grateful that I did that. And um, I'm really proud of the relationship that we've been able to build and have found her to be um, deeply understanding and compassionate. You know, she, she has celebrated um, me writing this book in so many ways, has shown up um, when I've done readings from it, even when it's difficult for her. And we've been able to have um, really deep conversations um, about her life and choices and, and my life and choices. And, and it's a choice that we make every day, you know, in some ways to show up and continue building. It's a work in progress, but I think both of us are committed to it. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. It's a beautiful example you set for the world, especially in this moment in time that we can reconcile and get past the narratives we have in our mind and write our way into new narratives with people that we think we have irreconcilable differences with or who've hurt us. So, yeah. um, all right, I'm going to switch to some questions from listeners and um, please type your questions in if you have them. I think some people have been already. I see a few here, but but don't forget to do that if you want to, if you're out there listening in your living room. Um, so here's one from a Watertown Armenian listener. Have you researched the intersection of Armenian and Ghanaian cultures and families? For example, I have Armenian relatives who lived in Ghana for a decade or two as import exporters. They were born in Syria and eventually settled in Australia. This seems to be, this is common in the diaspora. Hmm. 
Um, I haven't, I haven't encountered that. And I, I love knowing that. Um, and, you know, I spent quite a bit of time in Ghana and have met uh, some Lebanese um, people in Ghana and people from all over the world, but, but never an Armenian, but I'm, I'm really curious and would love to explore that connection more and that those intersections. So thank you for sharing that. So here is another question from a listener. Um, how connected do you feel to black history, black experience here in America? Is that a history you've studied as well? Yes, definitely. I mean, moving to America um, in, well, first of all, I should say my father was also educated in the United States and he had a very pan-African worldview. And so growing up in addition to teaching me about African history, he also really kind of wanted me to understand the ways in which the black diaspora was deeply connected and how the movement for um, against colonization and the civil rights movement in the United States were deeply connected. Um, and also sort of the more complicated um, history of slavery, for example, Ghana being sort of a major slave port and what accountability Ghanaians should hold and how we should tell those stories and understand them and honor the experiences of African Americans who are also our ancestors, you know, who who died, um, who are also our ancestors. You know, in Ghana, we have a, a tradition of pouring libation to ancestors. And my father would always say, you know, Black Americans um, are deeply connected to us in so many ways. And um, and so that was always, so growing up, I always um, learned a lot from him. I will say in school, in the international schools that I went to, um, Black history was not taught that much. Um, or American history wasn't taught that much either, but um, I guess what we got of African American history was mostly sort of a very whitewashed version of the civil rights movement. And so coming to America, um, I did feel it was important for me to better understand, you know, I could see from observing the way that segregation works, the way that systemic racism is built into many systems and structures in this country. Um, and so I did work really hard to deeply understand that. And in fact, that in some ways is my life's work now and the work that I do um, specifically addressing racial um, inequities in American cities. Um, and so have spent a lot of time exploring that and particularly felt important to me because when I came to America, I was so welcomed um, by the Black American community. And, um, and so it was important to me to deeply understand that experience, um, not to claim it as my own, um, but to, to see the ways that we're connected and also to work in solidarity with Black Americans and to continue sort of that legacy of Pan-Africanism. Here's a question that relates to that and that I love. Um, when you hear the word home, what is the first place that comes to mind? Um, so I don't think of home as a single place. And I think for much of my life, I really sought to have a single place that I could think of as home. You know, I, I, I now I think of home really expansively. You know, I view New York as home. America is home. Ghana is home. Tanzania is home. Um, and I sort of have decided that I'm going to claim all of the people that I belong to in complicated ways as home because I found, you know, in, in writing this book, I also found that home is complicated for a lot of people, even people who didn't grow up the way that I did sort of moving around the world. And, you know, home to me is, is an active thing that I can claim through love and through honoring um, the people um, who, who come from the places that, that I feel connected to. And so, yeah, I really take a really expansive view and not, I, I, I want to celebrate the multiplicity of what home has meant for me and to claim all of the different identities and people and places that have been really important in my life. I have to, I, I have to take a minute to go into one thing that relates to this and that it's related to some of these reader questions. Um, that I'm thinking about as, as uh, you grew up in so many different places that you, that obviously gives you perspective on what it means to be American and what America is. And there's a moment in your book where you write um, about your touring the International School of Rome and that your father expressed 
like he was kind of aghast at what he saw and he said oh you know this is it seems like all everybody's doing is painting and watching films and expressing their opinions and and he says something about like how how can they have so many opinions to express they're not even 18 yet don't you need to know things and your stepmother says um not in America everyone is entitled to their opinions no matter whether they have facts or not and I love that and it, it made me think about like how similar to some of these um, viewers' questions, listeners' questions, what, how, what did you feel like your, um, like how do you think that your view of America is influenced by the fact that you've seen it as an outsider in, from so many different vantage points? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think I have always had, you know, a sense of being American in, in many ways, because every time I would travel or move to a new country, that travel was facilitated by my American passport. And although my father traveled on a Ghanaian passport, which had sort of, or a UN passport, um, it was, you know, the my American passport, I always understood was something that was sort of a ticket to the world. And, um, and also because I knew that my mother lived in the United States and um, and was American. And so I've always thought of myself as with all of my identities as being like both of this place in many ways and also not of this place in many ways. And I also write in the book that America, even though I didn't grow up here, America is experienced around the world, you know, in, in terms of policy, in terms of um, culture, pop culture, music. Um, and so a lot of America was really familiar to me when I moved here. And then there are sort of the particular ways in which I had to also figure out how Americans were going to see me and my Americanness, um, and particularly being a Black person, um, you know, and sounding American. You know, the assumption was not unlike many of my African immigrant friends that I was an immigrant from somewhere else. And so uh, to go back to the previous question, in many ways, um, I, I have been assumed um, to be African American. and. Um, very quickly came to learn a lot about sort of the racial arrangement um, in America, if you will, will, and the ways that race has been used to sort of um, legislate belonging or displacement and how that is baked into policies. And that was always really interesting to me to see how I was um, received um, by different communities in this country. And America is a very like big, expansive, complicated place, you know, and um, I, I, I have loved getting to know um, America in so many ways and it's it, can, it my journey to understanding America is ongoing. As all of ours is, right? Um, yeah. So here's a question um, about faith from a, a listener. Uh, and this is from someone who's read the book. Uh, I thought one of the concluding chapters about faith was particularly moving. You discussed Christianity and your father and how you had put all of your faith in him only to have that faith shaken given what your stepmother revealed to you. Can you speak a bit about that? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. I think well, that was one of the places where I wanted to interrogate the stories, the harmful narratives that I had told myself. And I, I think like um, in some ways I had separated myself by from people who have religion or like past judgment on people believing particular stories. Um, and I realized how harmful that was and how hypocritical that was in, in sort of writing this book in the ways that I had so much faith in my father and sort of made of him this um, person who wasn't human anymore, you know, he was just sort of this idea, and how dehumanizing that was of his memory and story, um, and, and having, you know, that story of my father kind of called into question really made me interrogate, like, why I wanted to separate myself um, from people who believe other kinds of stories, um, but then also enabled me to, you um, to look at what faith means differently. And in the end, I sort of decided that faith doesn't mean um, believing in perfection or um, believing that, um, that there can't also be mystery. Um, faith is something that is, um, is very much connected to love and love is complicated and people are complicated. And so that's really what I wanted to write myself um, closer to. Okay. 
Um, and last thing, and then we're winding down, but if you have a quick answer to this, you speak um, often or you write often in your book about different, um, you, you mentioned Zadie Smith and you mentioned Toni Morrison. And do you wanna say anything about the role reading has played in your writing life and in coming up with this, how you composed this memoir? Yeah, I've always been a reader um, and I've always kind of had what I sometimes call a kitchen cabinet of mothers um, who are sort of writers um, and particularly black women writers, Audre Lorde, um, June Jordan, Toni Morrison, who I've turned to over and over again um, for wisdom and lessons. And um, that's always been sort of something that has been really important to me and really healing and um, and has guided me in so many ways. and. Um, I, I also think often of um, the James Baldwin quote that I'll sort of paraphrase where, where he said that you think that your pain is unique and that you're the only one who is feeling these things and then you read. And I have found that to be so true. And so um, as well as writing towards connection, I read towards connection and towards compassion and um, to sort of opening up my mind and worldview as well. Thank you. That is um, a great answer. And I think that's the place that we'll leave this, right? I love chatting about it. So thank, <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. That was such a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. And the thought that we could be moving toward reconciliation and forgiveness through writing and interconnectedness, um, it's just such beautiful, beautiful thoughts. Um, I don't know how it can get any better from here, but our tradition in the American Inspiration Author Series is to hear a last reading um, before some closing remarks, um, something inspirational, a call to action, words that will sit well with all of us to inspire us as we head into the days and the weeks ahead. Um, Nadia, I think you've picked out a really great reading. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so the final uh, very short um, reading that I wanted to share with you is actually connected to the question that um, one of the listeners asked about home. Um, and it's um, towards, it's at the very end of the book. Um, Let me show you my home. It is a border. It is the outer edge of both sides. It is where they drew the line. They drew the line right through me. I would like to file a territorial dispute. Let me show you my home. It is a live fault. The fault is in my body. Let me show you my home. It is a blue chair. I sought asylum here. I marked my application temporary. For myself, I am writing reconstruction, not elegy. Look into my eyes, see my glowing skin. My pores are open. I am made of the earth, flesh, ocean, blood, and bone of all the places I try to belong to and all the people I long for. I am pieces, I am whole, I am home. Thank you. That was so lovely. Um, thank you for those remarkable words. Um, before we move on to closing comments, I do want to remind folks that um, the book Aftershocks um, with Nadia Signature in it is available for purchase through special arrangement with Porter Square Books um, here in Cambridge. Our devoted partners in this series um, been with us for all 22 events. And please know that if you're up to something similar, writing your family history, writing your story of your family, writing about your complexities of your life. Um, our virtual doors at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society are wide open to anyone um, doing research. Our, the stacks are closed right now because of the pandemic, but our digital records are very accessible and the gateway to really all you need to do top flight genealogical research. You can connect with our genealogists on the phone, over Twitter, through our website, AmericanAncestors.org, where you'll find downloadable research guides and free educational resources. Um, visit digital.americanancestors.org to explore historical family and personal papers, town and government filings, religious records, and other unique primary source documents. Um, our mission remains to educate, inspire, and connect people.
We hope you will join us again virtually in the new year. Until then, um, Nadia, thank you so much for being here and sharing your book. Thank you, Jessica. It was really, really a pleasure. And I can't wait to, to listen to it many times over. Um, thank you so much. We wish all of you a very safe and inspirational evening. And thank you and good night to everyone. Thank you.